Welcome to this little video on the language of polynomials. Oh, language. Now, those of you who have not yet twigged, and hopefully you have, maths is all about the language of just about everything. And what tricks people the most is when exam questions use is words or language that people just don't understand. Well, I'm here hopefully to demystify this. Hello, salut, hola, hi. I can't, sadly, I can't read that. That's really embarrassing, but anyway. So, great little graphic, yes, to keep you visually entertained while I just ramble on. And I promise you, coming soon is my quite unpleasant person on video as soon as I get my study set up. So, bear with me. But those of you who are currently being taught by me, yes, as usual, there is the work I'd very much like you to do from the Cambridge Essentials textbook, which is an awesome textbook, by the way. Recap. Right, now I know many of you were grateful when we got off of quadratics and it was like, oh, please don't make me do the discriminant again. But yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are going back to algebra. And it's no real surprise really because methods one and two and methods three and four and all of the pure course if you're in the United Kingdom does in fact revolve around a huge amount of algebra. Actually, even when you go on applied or stats, there is a lot of algebra. But if you understand the language, there's no real big deal, right? Your brain has now had time to process all the stuff on quadratic, unless you've just watched that video and then, wow, your brain's been working hard. All you need to do is trust that this work will be easier, trust you can do it, and trust that I will show you how to do everything you felt you didn't understand before. A nice little graphic there, everything you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. Right, let's go back to quadratics. I promise I won't use that word discriminant again. Oops, <laughs> said discriminant, moving on. Recap, a quadratic is nothing more than a U-shape or N-shape if it's been reflected graph, right? So here is a fabulous example of a quadratic. Here is my equation, y equals x minus 2 squared minus 2. Those of you who are looking at this and hopefully already trying to work out what all of these numbers mean are on the way to saying that it has a standard quadratic which has been moved two places that way horizontally and two places down. So before I even know it, I know my minimum point is two minus two. And very happy, there is my minimum point. I can find other points as well, but we'll come back to that in a second. When we draw these things, we must, 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 and I've just done a lesson on methods three and four which says the same stuff. And in fact, there's more stuff in methods you have to write. You must make sure that you write down your x-axis intercept. So there we go. I've worked out and I've labeled my x-axis intercept. You'll notice that yes, there is a two on the axis, but I have also formally written the coordinate zero comma two, or that does look like zero twelve, but anyway. We write down, oh, that's my y-axis intercepts. Get it right there, and let's move to the x-axis intercepts. Same thing. Yes, I know I've got zero and one, but I must formally write down what my x-axis intercepts are. Now, how did you work that out? Well, use your calculator, basically. Yes, hilarious. I love this little graphic here that told me that everyone now thinks that their iPhone or their Android phone is a calculator. Uh, it does some calculator functions, but I really wouldn't rely on that. You'd need to make sure that you write your turning points. With quadratics, that's great. So there's my turning point. Either I can put it into turning point form, or I use my calculator to help me find this. And there's lots of different ways, if you remember, in being able to do this. Write down the equation of the curve. There is my equation of my curve written down. Yes, it might be in the question, but make sure you write it down. Axis labels. In this situation, there is my X, and there is my Y beautifully labeled for me. So if I was doing this in the exam, I'd have lots and lots of marks. I'd have one mark for the correct shape because it's either a U shape or an N shape. And I've put on all of my axis intercepts. I've got my labels and I've got my graph. Well, that's great for um, quadratics, but what about other graphs? Well, by the way, just on the side, just to find the x-axis intercepts. And the y-axis intercepts, you put y equal to zero, x equal to zero. I'm not gonna recap that. That's just there for you to remember. It's in the notes which you can download with this video. But what does it have to do with the language of polynomials? Well, language is really, really important. Understanding the language, and you can do basically anything in mathematics, except time travel. Although you would argue that time travel would be born out of the understanding of math mathematics, and I suppose a little bit of physics, 
But as it's not possible to time travel that I realize or that I know, we'll actually go back to what you need to know for this chapter. So first things first, the general form of a polynomial is given by that. Yee. What does that mean? Well, actually, here's a nice example. P of x equals 4x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x minus 4. What do we notice? First things first, each of my powers of x are descending. All that is is this n, n minus 1, blah, 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 blah. This a of n, a of n minus 1, basically is just saying our coefficient. So each of these terms has a coefficient. Now, please don't be tricked. Polynomials do not always need to have each of the x terms. It could have just gone like that. So 4x cubed plus 3x squared plus 4 is still a valid polynomial. Why am I writing it p of x? have no idea. To be perfectly honest with you, it's no different from writing it as f of x or g of x or y equals, but because this chapter is helping us to understand polynomials, it's got a capital P of x. Next thing you need to understand is the word coefficient, which is effectively the number in front of the x. So this 4 is a coefficient. This 3 is a coefficient. That 4 that I've just highlighted is not a coefficient. We'll jump straight to the fact that this is actually a constant term. Now, actually, it could be a coefficient if I wrote this as x to the power of 0, but I don't really want to split hairs. I don't actually have a lot to split. The leading term is, again, this whole 4x cubed business, right? It's the first term in the function. It's got the highest power of x to the power of n. And the degree of the polynomial sorry about my screen moving there, is actually the highest floating number, and 3. So, when a question asks you for the degree, the constant term, the leading term, the coefficient, that's asking you to write that stuff down. Let me go back to this recap of function notation. Let's just make the screen smaller so it all fits on. It's really, really important that you remember that coordinates, for example, 1, 3, can be expressed as f of 1 equals 3. What that means is that when I put 1 into my equation, when x is equal to 1, y is equal to 3. Really, really important for all of the stuff that will come up in methods 1 and 2. We would be able to substitute 1 into my equation, and out comes 3 as the y value. How does this work with polynomial form? Well, for example, and again, I know this is all written in note form, but I'll write it out again. x squared plus x minus 3. I want to find p of 1. Well, if I write p of 1 underneath my polynomial, what do you notice? Well, the x has become a 1. And so basically, it's saying to you, let x be 1. So I would just put 1 squared plus 1 minus 3. 1 plus 1 is 2 minus 3, so minus 1 would be my answer, right? So it's really important to note what that actually means. But it can also come at you backwards. And again, function notation, really, really important. If p of x is given by this equation here, and you're known the p of 1 equals 21, what does that actually mean? It means either when x is 1, y is 21, or a coordinate of 1, 21. But in this situation, I think that's going to be my most important. When x equals 1, y equals 21. But my equation doesn't start y equals. Well, then change it to p of x equals 21. Oh, how exciting. So what it now means is put 1 into that equation and find the value of c. So I now know that p of x is 21 is 2 times 1 to the power of 4 minus, see, I almost wrote a plus there, minus 1 to the power of 3 plus 2 times c times 1 plus 6. Oh, fabulous. 21 is equal to, well, what's that going to be? 2 minus 1 plus 2c plus 6. So 21 is equal to 2 minus 1 is 1 plus 6 is 7. Uh, that would mean, I've run out of room, 2c is equal to 14. So c would be equal to 7. Wow. What about trick notation? This is used ever such a lot as well. What does q of minus 1 equals q of 2 equals 0 mean? Well, they're just shortcutting writing out coordinates. What it's saying is, and don't worry about this q, remember polynomials do not just need to be labelled as p of x. They can be f of x, they can be q of x, they can be d of x. 
doesn't really matter. If they use different letters, it just means it's standing for different equations. All this means is that Q of minus 1 is equal to 0 and Q of 2 is equal to 0. So they're just trying to tell you that you can put two separate values into my equation, minus 1 and 2, and 0 comes out. Now in this situation, if we were interested in using that information and trying to link this all together, actually... This is also equal, if we were dealing with uh, anything to do with uh, polynomials, is also the roots of the equation. What do I mean by roots? Well, anywhere that the y value is 0 means it's crossing the x-axis. So here is negative 1, here is 2. If that was a polynomial, I could theoretically draw my polynomial. I could find the midpoint, I could find the turning point. And so that simple notation is just there to try and trick you. Right, adding and subtracting polynomials, easy peasy lemon squeezy. We can actually add these together. How? Well, simply by just doing P of X of Squeezy. Now notice again, we've got one called P and one called Q. Why? Well, we can't have a question have P of X have one thing, and then in the same question, P of X be something completely different. Remember in algebra, if we have X equals, we've got to have the same value of X throughout the equation. So if I'm going to do P of X, plus q of x, then all I'm going to do is x cubed minus 2x squared minus x minus 3 plus 3x squared minus 2x plus 10. Now normally, I would suggest putting that in brackets. Why? If this is a minus, you can have all sorts of troubles if you don't put them in brackets. But when it's a plus, it actually makes no difference. So, x cubed minus 2x squared minus x minus 3 plus 3x squared minus 2x plus 10. Now we're going to collect like terms. x cubed. I'm done. So I'm going to put a line through it to say that I've done it. Minus 2x squared plus 3x squared is plus x squared. Minus x minus 2x is minus 3x. Minus 3 plus 10 is plus 7. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just added together a polynomial. Now again, we need to be very careful here with this minusing polynomials. Because x cubed minus 2x squared minus x minus 3 minus 3x squared minus 2x plus 10. Now, if you wrote it that way, you would make horrible mistakes. In fact, you'd have no chance of getting the correct answer. Because at this moment in time, that minus only seems to belong to the minus 3x squared. Now, you might turn around and say, well, that's not a problem. I'll just remember it. Doesn't matter. If you don't write the brackets in the right place, the examiner will mark you wrong, regardless of actually if you get the right answer. If this is where you go wrong, that's where they stop marking. So notation is very important. Brackets around there will now make this x cubed, obviously this doesn't change, minus 3x squared plus 2x and minus 10, which will give me a very different answer. So there's my x cubed gone. Minus 2x squared minus 3x squared is minus 5x squared. So those have now been done. Minus x plus 2x is plus x. Minus 3 minus 10 is minus 13. All right, so be very, very careful that when you're substituting one thing for more than one thing to put them in brackets. Equating coefficients is awesome. This is just great. Now, coefficients, if you remember, is the first term. We have a polynomial here, which can be written in this form. They're telling you that B, C, and R are real numbers, and they want you to find the values of B, C, and R. Now, what's seriously, seriously important is this thing here called an equal sign. Anything on the left-hand side of the equals and anything on the right-hand side of the equals must be identical for that equals to actually be true. We can write it in different ways, but that's there just to try and trick you. So what does this have to do? How do we do this question if, we, if we're being told that this and this can be written in the same way, or they stand for the same thing. We'll just put an equals between them. So x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to x minus 2, x squared plus bx plus c plus r. Now, with maths, you are always trying to get the revolting-looking thing to look simpler. I don't know how to turn this into this. There's no shortcut way, but... The chances are I can turn this to look more like that by multiplying up my brackets. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply my brackets. So first times first, I'm going to get x cubed. In fact, I'm going to times x into all of this. So x cubed plus bx squared 
plus c x. Now I'm going to multiply the minus 2. Minus 2x squared minus 2bx minus 2c and that plus r is stuck on the end. So we are trying to compare coefficients. What does that mean? We're trying to compare the numbers in front of the x cubed, the x squared and the uh, x and the constant with this over here. But how many terms does this currently have? Well, it seems to have four terms. This has way more terms. But why? Well, look, we've got an x squared term and an x squared term here. We've got an x term here and an x term here. So what I'm going to do to make life easier for me is actually factorize. So I'm going to get x cubed. Now I'm going to deal with my x squared. x squared becomes b minus 2. Then I'm going to do my x's. So I've done all my x squared terms now. I've done my x cubed. I've got uh, c minus 2b. So the c was taken out of there and the minus 2b there. And this minus 2c plus r. Now actually, because these don't have any x's in them, they must, must, must be the same as my coefficient. So remember, sorry, my constant. See, you've got me at it now. My constant. They must be my constant because we've got no x's in them. Where do I go now? Well, I literally compare things. What have I got here? An x cubed and an x cubed. They are the same? Yes. What's the coefficient of this? 1. What's the coefficient of that? 1. So now let's move on. Oh, I know that 3x squared, where did I get that from? Here. Now must be the same as x squared times b minus 2. Well, writing it out like this means I can now say, well, I can divide both sides by x squared, which becomes 1. So that leaves me with 3 is equal to b minus 2. Oh, hold on a minute. b must, therefore, be 5. Wow! And now I go on and do the same with x. I've got plus 2x is equal to uh, x times c minus 2b. Well, x is going to there once, so I get 2 is equal to c minus 2b. Hold on a minute, I don't know what the value of b is. Oh yeah, I do, it's 5. So 2 is equal to 2 lots of 5. Where did I get the 5 from? Here, because I already worked it out. So I'm going to add 10 to both sides, so c is equal to 12. And finally, we can find the value of r, because I know that minus 2c plus r must equals 1. Why? Well, there's my constant there, and I know that that's on my constant. So minus 24 plus r equals 1, so r becomes equal to 25. Having found my values of b, c, and r, my examiner will be well happy, because I have shown I can do these questions. Well, Pascal's triangle. Now, great news. I'm not actually going to cover that in this video. I am going to add an additional video dealing with Pascal's triangle and how to multiply our equations, because this one's almost nearly 20 minutes long, and I'm pretty sure you've heard enough. All right, well, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to seeing you a little bit later on when we deal with the next exciting installment of Maths Methods. All right, take care, guys. See you soon. Hey, guys, if you've enjoyed watching this video, why not tune in and subscribe to get updates of when I do other videos? Alternatively, click this video that's coming up now or just zip on over to mathsguru.com, M-A-F-F-S, guru.com, where you can actually access all the videos in a nice, easy-to-use way.